Wow. I can hardly believe it. So you might be equally as shocked and amazed as I was to find out that somewhere in this video will be my 800th Backtracks album shout-out. 800. And if you guess which one it is, you win the satisfaction of knowing you got the answer right. Welcome once again to Tom's Hit Parade. Today I will be bringing you some Backtracks, my monthly roundup of notable album anniversaries divisible by five with at least one Spotlight album review. So without wasting any time, let's just dip on in and see which albums are celebrating anniversaries for the month of October 2020. October of 1955 saw the release of Errol Garner's Concert by the Sea. Accompanied by bassist Eddie Calhoun and drummer Denzel Best, this concert at the Sunset Center in Carmel, California, was recorded by Will Thornbury, an engineer for the Armed Forces Radio Network, just for himself and his fellow servicemen. But when Garner's manager Martha Glazer played it for Columbia jazz producer George Avakian, he liked it so much that he chose to release it commercially. The album went on to sell over half a million copies, qualifying for gold status, but was never awarded certification by the RIAA. Also released 65 years ago this month was Music for Torching, Billie Holiday's first 12-inch LP on the Clef label. Produced by Norman Granz and recorded in the same two sessions, two days apart, that also produced all the songs for her follow-up album Velvet Mood, this album of Torch songs featuring Harry Sweets Edison on trumpet, Jimmy Rolls on piano, and Larry Bunker on drums includes Holiday's renditions of It Had to Be You, A Fine Romance, Cole Porter's I Get a Kick Out of You, and the Harold Arlen and Johnny Mercer classic Come Rain or Come Shine. Released six decades ago this month was Connie Francis Sings Jewish Favorites. Being fluent in Yiddish and familiar with Hebrew songs after growing up in an Italian Jewish neighborhood in Newark, New Jersey, coupled with the success of her album of Italian songs the previous year, prompted her to release this album, which spent 10 weeks on the Billboard chart, peaking at number 69, including her renditions of Oifen Pripetschik, I Love You Much Too Much, Yosel Yosel, Oh Mein Papa, and of course, Hava Nagila, the instrumentals recorded in London had to be shipped to Hollywood for Connie's vocal overdubs because she was in the middle of filming for her first movie role. Also released in October of 1960 was Nancy Wilson's sophomore album, Something Wonderful. As was her debut album, Like in Love, this set was produced by Dave Cavanaugh and Tom Tippy Morgan and arranged and conducted by Billy May, famous for his work with Frank Sinatra and Nat King Cole. Among the album's tracks are one of Nancy's signature songs, Guess Who I Saw Today, the T-Bone Walker blues classic, Call It Stormy Monday, But Tuesday's Just As Bad, the Johnny Mercer Harold Arlen tune, This Time the Dream's On Me, and the classic standard, What a Little Moonlight Can Do. In October of 1965, Donovan released his sophomore album, Fairy Tale. Featuring mostly just Donovan on acoustic guitar and harmonica, this folk-style album reached number 20 on the UK chart and produced just one charting single, Colors, which reached number 4. When released in the U.S. a month later, the album peaked at number 85 on the Billboard chart. Single Universal Soldier, a cover of the Buffy St. Marie hit, was not on the U.K. version of the album, but was included on the U.S. release after the single reached number 53 on the Billboard chart, higher than Colors peak of number 61 in the U.S. Universal Soldier also saw success in Australia, becoming a top 20 single. Non-charting single To Try for the Sun was covered by Lindsay Buckingham on his 2006 album Under the Skin. Also released 55 years ago this month was It Ain't Me Babe, the debut album by The Turtles. It only peaked at number 98 on the Billboard 200, but it yielded a top 10 chart hit with the Bob Dylan penned title track, which reached number 8 on the Billboard Hot 100 and peaked at number 3 on the Canadian singles chart. Subsequent single Let Me Be went top 20 in Canada and top 40 in the US. The album features two other Bob Dylan covers, including an abbreviated take on Like a Rolling Stone, as well as the P.F. Sloan song Eve of Destruction and original songs from the group's high school years. And as a trivia note, the band members needed their parents' written permission to record the album because they were still underage at the time. Half a century ago this month saw the release of The Jackson 5 Christmas Album, the fourth album overall and the first holiday album by The Jackson 5. A critical favorite as well as a commercial success, it sold over 3.5 million copies worldwide, was the best-selling Christmas album of both 1970 and 1972, and topped Billboard's Christmas Albums chart during all four weeks of its publication in December of 1970. The group's versions of Santa Claus is Coming to Town and I Saw Mommy Kissing Santa Claus have remained popular on holiday radio ever since. The album also includes their spirited renditions of Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas, 
The Little Drummer Boy, and one of my personal holiday favorites, Someday at Christmas. Also released in October of 1970 was the Guess Who's seventh album, Share the Land. The follow-up to their U.S. Top 10 and Canadian number 1 album, American Woman, and their first album without founding member Randy Bachman, it was a Top 10 album in the band's native Canada, peaking at number 7, and reached the Top 20 of the U.S. charts, climbing to number 14. Lead-off single, Hand Me Down World, went Top 10 in Canada and Top 20 in the U.S. The follow-up single release of the title track reached number 2 on the Canadian chart and number 10 on the Billboard Hot 100. Hang On To Your Life just missed the U.S. Top 40, but was a Top 5 hit on the Canadian Singles Chart. And as a trivia note, the cabin in which the album cover was shot was at the top of a hill, and according to frontman Burton Cummings, they were all outpaced on their climb up that hill by the 81-year-old Cherokee man seen in the cover photo. 45 years ago this month, Art Garfunkel released his sophomore solo album, Breakaway. Although his debut peaked higher on the Billboard 200 at number 5, it only achieved gold certification, whereas this album went platinum despite only reaching number 7. It also peaked at number 7 in the UK and reached number 6 on the Canadian Albums Chart. The title track made the top 40 on the Billboard Singles Chart, while his cover of the doo-wop hit I Only Have Eyes For You went top 20 in the US and reached number 1 in the UK. My Little Town, a duet with former partner Paul Simon, reached number 9 on both the US and Canadian singles charts, and also appeared on Simon's album, Still Crazy After All These Years, which was released the same month. Art Garfunkel performed the latter two singles, My Little Town with Paul Simon, when he was the musical guest on the second episode ever of Saturday Night Live. Also released in October of 1975 was Trying to Get the Feeling, the third album by Barry Manilow. Peaking at number 5 on the Billboard 200 and earning double platinum certification by the RIAA, the album yielded two hit singles, I Write the Songs, topped the Billboard Hot 100 and the Billboard Adult Contemporary Charts, reached number 3 in Canada, and peaked at number 5 in Australia and South Africa. Follow-up single, Trying to Get the Feeling Again, hit number 1 on the Adult Contemporary Charts in the US and Canada, reached number 10 on the Billboard Hot 100, and number 13 on the Canadian Singles Chart. The album also spawned two fan-favorite tracks, New York City Rhythm, and his rendition of Bandstand Boogie, which served as the theme for the TV show American Bandstand from 1977 to 1986. The album cover was spoofed four years later by Ray Stevens for his album The Feeling's Not Right Again, which included his song I Need Your Help, Barry Manilow. Happy 40th anniversary this month to The Talking Head's fourth album, Remain in Light. It was a top 10 album in Canada, peaking at number 6, but it only reached number 19 in the US and number 21 in the UK although it achieved gold certification in all three of those countries. The most popular single to be issued from the album, Once in a Lifetime, went top 20 in the UK and Ireland, reached number 23 in Australia, number 24 in the Netherlands, and along with preceding single, Cross-Eyed and Painless, peaked at number 20 on the Billboard Dance Songs chart. Subsequent single, Houses in Motion, went top 40 in Ireland and climbed to number 50 in the UK. The album garnered widespread critical acclaim and is ranked highly on several lists of best albums of the 80s, including number 11 by NME, number 6 by Slant, number 4 by Rolling Stone, and number 2 by Pitchfork. October of 1980 also saw the release of The Police's third album, Zenyatta Mondata. It reached the top of the album's charts in Australia, the UK, and France, peaked at number 2 in Canada and the Netherlands, number 3 in New Zealand, and number 5 in the US, where it earned double platinum certification and remained on the album chart for nearly three years. It went platinum in the UK, New Zealand, France, and Canada. Both of the album's singles, Don't Stand So Close To Me and Di Do 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 Di Da Da Da, reached number 10 on the Billboard Hot 100, reached the top 10 in Australia, New Zealand, and the Netherlands, and the top 5 in the UK, Canada, and Spain, with Don't Stand So Close to Me hitting number 1 in the UK and Ireland, and number 2 in Canada and New Zealand. The album earned the police two Grammy Awards, Best Rock Instrumental Performance for the album track Behind My Camel, and Best Rock Performance by a Duo or Group with Vocals for Don't Stand So Close to Me. In October of 1985, In Excess released their fifth album, Listen Like Thieves. It topped the album's chart in the band's native Australia for two weeks. It peaked at number 4 in New Zealand, number 11 in the US, and number 24 in Canada. It achieved quadruple platinum status in the UK and went double platinum in the US. First single, What You Need, gave the band their first top 10 single in the US where it peaked at number 5. It also reached number 2 on the Australian singles chart and number 21 in Canada. Follow-up singles This Time and Kiss the Dirt, Falling Down the Mountain, went top 20 in Australia, and the title track was a top 40 Australian single. This Time and the title track landed in the top 20 of the Billboard Mainstream Rock Tracks chart. 
Also released 35 years ago this month was AHA's debut album Hunting High and Low. It peaked at number one on the album charts in New Zealand, Sweden, and the band's native Norway, climbed to number two in the UK, reached number 12 in Canada, and number 15 on the Billboard 200. The debut single, Take On Me, was a massive hit, topping singles charts in over a dozen countries, including Australia, the Netherlands, Belgium, Poland, and the US, where it spent 27 weeks on the Billboard Hot 100. Its innovative music video gained heavy rotation on MTV and became one of the most iconic music videos of all time. Follow-up single, The Sun Always Shines on TV, reached number one in the UK and Ireland, number two in Norway and Sweden, and went top 20 in Australia and the US. Train of Thought was another Norwegian number one, and the title track hit the top five on the French, Irish, and UK singles charts. With their Best New Artist nomination, AHA became the first Norwegian band ever to be nominated for a Grammy. Three decades ago this month, The Laws released their self-titled and only album. Produced by Steve Lillywhite, the album peaked at number 30 in the UK, but just barely made the Billboard 200, climbing no higher than number 196. Nevertheless, it was a critical favorite and has since become something of a cult classic, appearing on Enemy's list of the 500 greatest albums of all time, and in the book 1001 Albums You Must Hear Before You Die. The single, There She Goes, became one of the defining songs of the 90s, even though it only reached number 49 on the Billboard Hot 100. It was the band's only single to break the top 20 of any country's primary singles chart, reaching number 13 in the UK. Enemy placed There She Goes at number 22 on their list of the 500 greatest songs of all time. A cover version released in 1999 by Sixpence None the Richer went top 40 in the US and top 20 in Canada and the UK. Also released in October of 1990 was Change of Season, the 14th album by Daryl Hall and John Oates. It only reached number 60 on the Billboard 200, making it their first album since War Babies in 1974 to peak outside the top 40 in the US. It climbed to number 13 in Japan, number 39 in Canada, and number 44 in the UK. Lead-off single, So Close, was the duo's last top 40 hit to date on the Billboard Hot 100, peaking at number 11, although it did climb to number 5 on the Canadian singles chart. Don't Hold Back Your Love was a top 10 hit in Canada, and Starting All Over Again reached the Canadian top 20. So Close was co-written and co-produced by John Bon Jovi, and the album track, Heavy Rain, was written and co-produced by Dave Stewart of Eurythmics. Turning 25 years old this month is Tragic Kingdom, the third album by No Doubt. It was a number one album in nine countries, including the US, Canada, Belgium, and Denmark, and a top 10 album in a dozen others, including number two in the Netherlands, number three in Australia and the UK, and number four in Scotland. It currently enjoys diamond certification in the US and Canada, triple platinum in Australia, and platinum in the UK. Seven singles were issued from the album, with Just a Girl peaking at number three in the UK and Australia, and reaching the top 10 in New Zealand, the top 20 in the Netherlands and Sweden, and the top 40 on the Billboard Hot 100. And Don't Speak, topping the singles charts in at least seven countries, including Australia, the UK, and Canada. Spiderwebs was a top 20 single in Canada, Excuse Me Mister reached the top 20 in New Zealand, and Sunday Morning hit the top 40 in Australia. The album scored no doubt Grammy nominations for Best Rock Album and Best New Artist. October of 1995 also saw the release of What's the Story, Morning Glory, the sophomore album by Oasis. It topped the UK albums chart for 10 weeks and also reached number one in several other countries including Australia, Canada, and Spain. It peaked at number 3 in Austria, number 4 in the US, and number 5 in Italy, and was a top 10 album in at least 10 other countries. It certified quadruple platinum in the US and 15 times platinum in the UK, the highest certification by the BPI until it was surpassed by Adele's 21 in 2011. Of the six singles released from the album, Wonderwall was the most successful, reaching number 1 in Australia, number 2 in the UK and Ireland, and the top 10 of the Canadian, US, and Dutch singles charts. Don't Look Back in Anger hit number one in the UK and Ireland, and number two in Sweden. Champagne Supernova went top 20 in Canada and reached number one on the Billboard Alternative Songs chart. The album won a Brit Award for British Album of the Year, and Wonderwall scored a Brit nomination for British Single of the Year, and two Grammy nominations, including Best Rock Song. In October of 2000, U2 released their 10th album, All That You Can't Leave Behind. It topped the album's charts in 32 countries, including Canada, Australia, the UK, France, and Finland. It peaked at number two in Poland and number three in the US, and was their best-selling album since 1991's Achtung Baby, and their fourth best-selling album overall. It achieved multi-platinum certifications in a dozen countries. 
All four of the album's singles were number one hits on the Canadian singles chart and top five hits in the UK, with Beautiful Day reaching number one, Stuck in a Moment You Can't Get Out Of climbing to number two, and Elevation elevating its way up to number three. All three of those singles topped the Irish singles charts as well, with Elevation also hitting number one in the Netherlands. The album was nominated for 12 Grammy Awards, including Album of the Year, and won seven, including Best Rock Album, and is the only album in Grammy history to win the Record of the Year Award in two consecutive years, Beautiful Day in 2001 and Walk On in 2002. Also released in October of 2000 was No Name Face, the debut album by Lifehouse. It peaked at number six on the Billboard 200 and was also a top 10 album in Denmark, where it reached number two, Canada, where it climbed to number four, New Zealand, where it hit number seven, and Australia, where it came in at number 10. It's been certified platinum in Canada and double platinum in the US. The album produced the hit single, Hanging By A Moment, which topped the Billboard Adult Top 40 and Alternative Songs charts, spent five weeks at number one on the Australian singles charts, and reached number two on the Billboard Hot 100, and was the most played single on radio in 2001. The follow-up single, Six Cycle Carousel, placed on the Billboard Alternative Songs chart, and third single, Breathing, reached the top 20 of the Billboard Adult Top 40 chart and the New Zealand Singles chart. Happy 15th anniversary this month to Stevie Wonder's 23rd album, A Time to Love. His first album in 10 years and his most recent album to date, it peaked at number 5 on the Billboard 200, reached number 9 in Sweden and Norway, and climbed to number 24 in the UK and Switzerland. Lead-off single, So What the Fuss, was a top 20 single in the UK and went top 40 in Ireland and on the Billboard R&B and Adult Contemporary charts. Subsequent single, From the Bottom of My Heart, was also a top 40 Billboard Adult Contemporary single and earned Stevie his first Grammy in 29 years in the category of Best Male Pop Vocal Performance. The album features appearances by Prince and En Vogue on So What the Fuss, India Ari and Paul McCartney on the title track, as well as gospel musicians Kim Burrell and Kirk Franklin. October of 2005 also saw the release of Christmas Songs, Diana Krall's eighth studio album and her first full-length holiday release. On the jazz album's charts, it came in at number one in the US, number four in Australia, and number five in the UK. It reached the top of the Billboard Holiday Albums chart and climbed to number two on the Primary Albums chart in Diana's native Canada, where it currently holds double platinum certification. This was her first album on which she was backed by a big band, as opposed to the smaller jazz combos she customarily records with. It features her interpretations of holiday standards such as White Christmas, Winter Wonderland, The Christmas Song, Sleigh Ride, and Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas. The album cover was photographed by film director Samantha Taylor Johnson. In October of 2010, I cannot believe it's been that long, Bruno Mars released his debut album Doo-Wops and Hooligans. It peaked at number one in eight countries, including the UK, Germany, and Canada, and reached the top ten of a dozen more, including number two in Australia, number three in the US, and number five in Mexico. It holds multi-platinum certifications in ten countries, including six times platinum in the UK and the US. Its first two singles, Just the Way You Are and Grenade, were both number one hits in ten countries, including the UK, Australia, and New Zealand, and on the Hot 100 and Adult Contemporary charts in both the US and Canada. Subsequent singles, The Lazy Song and Marry You, both went top 10 in Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, with The Lazy Song also reaching number one in the UK and Denmark. The album received Grammy nominations for Album of the Year and Best Pop Vocal Album. Grenade garnered three gra Grammy nominations, including Record of the Year and Song of the Year, and Just the Way You Are won the Grammy for Best Male Pop Vocal Performance. Also celebrating its 10th anniversary this month is Taylor Swift's third album, Speak Now. It spent six non-consecutive weeks at number one on the Billboard 200 and 13 weeks at number one on the Billboard Country Albums chart. It also topped the Canadian and Australian Albums charts as well as the Australian Country Albums chart and was a top 10 album in seven other countries. Of its six singles, all but one were top 20 hits on the Billboard Hot 100. Mine and Back to December went top 10 in the US and Canada, with Mean also reaching the Canadian top 10, but just missing that mark in the US where it reached number 11. Mine also charted in the top 10 in Australia and Japan. On the Billboard Country Songs chart, Sparks Fly and Hours both reached number one, while Mine and Mean both peaked at number two. Mean won Grammys for Best Country Song and Best Country Solo Performance, and Speak Now got a Grammy nomination for Best Country Album. Five years ago this month, Pentatonix released their self-titled fourth album. 
It was their first album to reach number one on the Billboard 200. It was their first top 10 album in Australia, where it peaked at number five, and became their second top 10 album in Canada, where it climbed to number seven. It's also their highest charting album thus far in the UK at number 18. Their first album to feature almost entirely original material, as opposed to mostly covers, the lead-off single Can't Sleep Love, their first original track to be released as a single, was a top 20 hit in Japan, a top 40 single in Belgium, and made the top 20 of the Billboard Adult Contemporary Singles chart. The only cover on the standard version of the album is If I Ever Fall In Love, a rendition of the hit 1992 R&B single by Shy, which was a hit for the UK group East 17 four years later. Pentatonic's version features guest vocals by Jason Derulo. Also released in October of 2015 was Dopamine, the debut album by Borns. It peaked at number two on the Billboard Alternative and Rock Albums charts, and at number 24 on the Billboard 200. It's been certified gold by the RIAA. Single Electric Love charted in the top 10 of the Billboard Adult Alternative Songs chart and the top 20 of the Billboard Rock Songs chart, and also reached number 24 on the Canadian Rock Songs chart. Two subsequent singles also reached the Billboard Adult Alternative Songs chart, 10,000 Emerald Pools reached number 7, and American Money climbed to number 14. Both songs ranked in the top 40 of the Billboard Rock Songs chart. The album reached number 56 on the Canadian Albums chart. Okay, let's check out the two Spotlight albums we have for the month of October 2020. The first one uh, turns 55 years old this month, and this that makes it, I think, one of the oldest, or perhaps the oldest, Spotlight album that I've done this year so far. It was released in October of 1965. It is the self-titled debut album by the Paul Butterfield Blues Band. Yes, I'm not really well versed in blues uh, outside of B.B. King. He's pretty much the only traditional blues artist that I've really delved into a whole lot, and that's thanks to my sister. I inherited some of his CDs in her collection, uh, and I've you know checked out uh, Robert Cray and Keb Mo, but they're more on the contemporary blues side of things. Uh, but still, I think I can tell a good blues album when I hear one, and this is a good one. Uh, I was expecting a great album pretty much when I saw that Mike Bloomfield and Elvin Bishop were taking part in the lineup here, and I'm not well versed either in um, either of their respective works in their catalogs, but I've heard enough of their names uh, over the years in you know of my interest in music to know that they are obviously well respected and talented musicians in their field. And boy, this uh, I, I wasn't even prepared for how amazing the guitar work is, for, for one thing, on this album. And I'm not sure uh, who plays which parts, wh whether I'm hearing Mike Bloomfield or Elvin Bishop, uh, you know, from song to song, but this is, as I said, some of the best blues guitar work I have ever heard outside of B.B. King. Just fantastic stuff. And this is pretty much a first-rate blues album if you're looking to get into the more traditional uh, electrified blues like the Chicago blues. Check out the Paul Butterfield Blues Band. They're fantastic. Uh, Shake Your Moneymaker was the first song on here that really uh, stood out to me. That's track two. And uh, I really liked the organ, which was by Mark Naftalin, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, on Thank You, Mr. Poobah, which is actually a uh, Paul Butterfield original. Uh, yeah, most of the songs on here are blues covers. Uh, we've got uh, the Muddy Waters classic, I Got My Mojo Working. And that's actually, curiously enough, the only song on here uh, whose vocals are sung by drummer Sam Lay. Uh, most of the other songs are uh, sung by Paul Butterfield. And then also uh, another classic blues uh, cover on here is the Junior Parker classic Mystery Train. Um, both of those covers are just outstanding, and, well, as is pretty much everything on this album, honestly. Uh, Look Over Yonder's Wall, which is the last track on the album, yeah, the final track on the album, it actually kind of sounded like a, a spiritual you know, one of the uh, you know uh, African American spirituals that you might have heard in in uh, you know in black churches or you know gospel choirs or something like that. So, and that's kind of one thing that that kind of attracts me to blues is I, I'm not into gospel music just because I'm not actively religious, but uh, just there's just something about the more spiritual kind of music that you you can just you you can tell that they're feeling what they're singing in a lot of spirituals. Uh, so that's one thing that kind of attracted me to, for some reason, to look over Yonder Wall. It was written by Jay Clark, and I don't know who Jay Clark is, and, but in my defense, as I said, I'm not very well ver versed in blues, so Jay Clark could be a very well-known blues uh, artist or songwriter. So, But anyway, long story short, this was just a fantastic uh, blues album, and yeah, I am slowly but surely dipping my toes more and more into blues, and so I just, something told me that this was going to be a good album to check out uh, when I saw its anniversary date rolling around. So, and yeah, I was right. It's uh, yeah, very, very, very good album.
Now, as for my second Spotlight album for the month of October 2020, this is a noteworthy Backtracks video here uh, in that it is the first one to feature a repeat appearance by an artist that I previously spotlit. Yes, uh, believe it or not, I have not repeated an artist on my Backtrack Spotlight albums until now. Uh, the artist in question in this case is Led Zeppelin, and for this month, the Spotlight album is their third album, Led Zeppelin III. It was released in October of 1970, so it, it turns 50 years old. It's celebrating this 50th anniversary this month. And my last Zeppelin Spotlight was Houses of the Holy back in March of 2018. So it's been a while. I figured it was about time to uh, bring Zeppelin back into the spotlight. And uh, yes, definitely high time to do that. Uh, now, uh, if you may recall uh, when I did my ranking of my favorite new albums of the year back at the end of 2018, I also did a ranking of my favorite Backtrack Spotlight albums of that year. And I ranked Houses of the Holy at number two for the year only because a Beatles album made it to number one. They were only beaten out by the Beatles. And so it's, 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 kind of, it's kind of hard to beat out Led Zeppelin, but the Beatles are about the only band that could do it, probably. And uh, speaking of number ones, uh, this album hit number one on the U.S., Canadian, U.K., Denmark, and Italian album charts, and maybe a couple others. That was all that I put down on my list for my notes. Uh, this album ranks six times platinum in the U.S., triple platinum in Australia and Canada. And, you know, it's like I could spout more dry statistics about the album, but uh, let's just go on and talk about the album itself. Now, albums like this and artists like Led Zeppelin are the reason why I am so glad I thought up the concept of backtracks for this channel. Until 2018, I was just criminally neglectful of music that came out before my time, my time being the 80s in my opinion, and I wanted a vehicle whereby I could explore classic albums and classic artists that I'd been ignoring, and you know, Led Zeppelin being one of the many, many artists that uh, I had just been completely overlooking just because, for some stupid reason, I had very little interest in classic music or older music. And honestly, I had no idea how much I needed, not just wanted, but needed to do backtracks and to get into these classic albums until I started discovering the amazing artists and albums like this. Now, from the very start, this album is just amazing. Immigrant Song is the opening track. It kicks ass from the moment it starts with the that locomotive instrumental and that wailing refrain. It's like, oh my god, can it get any better than this, honestly? And, and speaking of that, when, if I can pause for a second, there are so many classic songs that I don't know them by the title, but as soon as I hear them, it's like, oh yeah, that's that song. And, and Immigrant Song is one of the many, many songs that fits in that uh, criteria for me. So it's like, once I heard it, it's like, oh yeah, this kicks ass. It's like, okay, I'm okay with this album. So uh, yeah, and it just, it pretty much didn't let up until, well, basically side two, pretty much. Side one is the more rockin' side, and side two is kind of a bit more of the mellow uh, acoustic side, kind of, uh, roughly speaking anyway. Uh, the song Friends has an interesting sound to it. Uh, I, I don't know if it's... I, is it minor chords? Is that what makes the song so interesting? Is it done in minor chords? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of done that way. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I really, really like that one, that song, Friends. And uh, Since I've Been Loving You is a beautiful, slow, kind of a bluesy ballad. So in that respect, it kind of went along with the Paul Butterfield Blues Band. So this is kind of the blues month for backtracks in a way. And Out on the Tiles was another just great kick-ass rocker. It's kind of got that, that classic... Uh, the, the classic Led Zeppelin sound that you hear in all of their big singles. It's like, that could have been a, signal, a single. It was just fantastic. And then uh, That's the Way sounded familiar to me, and I soon realized why about uh, 30, 40 seconds into it. It's heard in the movie Almost Famous, one of my favorite uh, music-related movies. It brings back memories of the movie. So that, that's one reason, one of several reasons why I like that song. Just got a great acoustic vibe to it, just fantastic. Tangerine is another song that I rather enjoyed. Uh, although, you know, for Zeppelin, it's a rather ordinary kind of song, you know. I mean, it, it doesn't make it a bad song. It's just kind of, you know, there's nothing that really makes it stand out and makes it unique. Just kind of a, a bit more of a formulaic track, in my opinion. And uh, Hats Off to Roy Harper was... Uh, that was the closing track on here, and that was kind of unusual. It reminded me a little bit of later Beatles in the fact that it was it seemed to sound a little bit uh, experimental, so they were doing their experimental thing on that song. So yeah, all in all, uh, if you as if you couldn't tell, I love this album. It's fantastic. Uh, if I had known that my next full album experience with Led Zeppelin was going to be this rewarding, uh, I might have spotlit Physical Graffiti back when it dropped earlier this year. I think it was in February was when it celebrated an anniversary as well. So. But in a way, I'm glad I waited until this one. And this, by the way, this is only the second full album of Led Zeppelin I've heard. Yes, it's like, that, as I said, you know, I'm, I've been woefully neglectful in classic albums. But uh, honestly, this is really turning 
turning the corner for me on Led Zeppelin. I think I'm just going to start collecting their uh, studio albums uh, as I can afford them. A friend of mine uh, recommended Led Zeppelin 2 to me as uh, as the next step in Led Zeppelin, and that's what's going to be the next step, I think, for me, just because I, I kind of trust Ryan's judgment. He sees, uh, he steered me well in a couple of things uh, with regard to new music uh, recently, so uh, yeah, I, I would not hesitate to uh, comply with his recommendation, so thank you, Ryan, because I, I'm really starting to appreciate how good Led Zeppelin is. Not that I didn't think that they were good. That's, you know, just let me qualify the way I put that. Uh, my close friend of 25 years lives down in San Diego. Uh, he cites Led Zeppelin as his favorite band of all time. So, and of course, I've heard the singles. I mean, I've got their Mothership uh, compilation on CD. Of course, their singles kick ass, pretty much all of them. But I have never explored, as I said, until recently, their, their albums. And I am not stopping here absolutely not not by a long shot this is just a fantastic album and uh i hate to say it but it's probably not going to be number one in uh, my countdown this year either just because there are a couple of really really great albums that kind of uh strike a personal meaning to me uh as you know more so than zeppelin as fantastic as led zeppelin 3 is don't get me wrong but yes a, a very 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 rewarding listen excellent excellent album and yeah i am definitely going to uh delve much deeper into Led Zeppelin's discography. Fantastic. But for now, that'll do it for Backtracks for the month of October 2020. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, hit that like button and share it with your friends. And give me your thoughts, questions, suggestions, or constructive criticisms in the comments section below. Also, scroll down to the description for a link to my Twitter and Instagram feeds, and links to my favorite fellow YouTubers who are all worth checking out. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel and browse my past videos, and be sure to ring that notifications bell so you'll be the first to know each time I drop a new video. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time, and remember, life's too short to be a music snob.